I have a few announcements before I tell you about successful in vetting. First, I want to pay special thanks to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and to DPAC for putting together a fantastic program. I don't know how many of you are out there across America watching, but here we have a pretty good representation of Silicon Valley inventors. And uh, our election host today was Wilson Sonsini, who Richard was out of the law firm I've been dealing with for many years, who were the original law firms for Google and Facebook and so forth. And this little handout that they have on their table is not in any aspects. So pick up a package from the AI. It won't help you with your headaches, but it could help you with your digestive system. Okay. In Venice Digest, I'm a frequent contributor. I've been around it since the 1980s. It's a fantastic publication. It's the only publication, to my knowledge at least, that is totally devoted to the inventor creative community. So if you're not a subscriber, I suggest you do. They have a great website and unbelievable information from successful inventors and what to do and what not to do. Okay. I have been asked on many occasions, how long have you been involved in mentoring inventors? and being involved with the Patent Office. Well, I started working with the Patent Office in 1982, which is, what, 40, 41, 40? Anyway, all right. I want to show you something, then I'll get into the series in success on the name. Here's a program <laughs> that I produced in San Francisco at the Civic Auditorium, Invention and New Product Exhibition. Okay, inside was all of the information, there's the layout of the booths, and so forth. And what I'm going to tell you is that I did this program before probably all of you were born. This program is copyrighted by Lawrence J. Dell in 1956. Okay, which is too many words I can remember. 1956, and it was before that, but I started mentoring inventors. My father was a successful inventor, part of the Atomic Energy Commission, and so forth. So the world of inventing is not new. It goes back eons. But if you stop and consider, just for a moment, every product in your life, the lights, the car, your cell Everything you have is the product of a creative mind. And if it wasn't for those creative minds, we would not be where we are today, which is argumentative, is it good or bad, where we are today. But stop and think. You have, in your ability as an individual, creative, etc., to change the future, to make the future better, to make the future brighter, and to make it a future for our children, our grandchildren, and our heirs to come. You, as a single individual, have that ability. Never forget it. But don't get blinded by your own ambitions and the word I hate to use, greed. I have seen inventors that I've worked with that were not successful because of greed. And the other reason was that as the inventor, they were individuals who did not necessarily share their dream or their desires or their wishes with their spouse. You're an inventor, you're not an inventor alone. Your family, your children of any age are part of your inventive future. When your little boy asks for a tricycle, well, I'm sorry, I can't buy one because I had to give the money to the patent attorney. All due respects to patent attorneys. Um, that's another program. Uh, so keep in mind, though, you need to share. You need to share what you're doing. And if your grandmother says, 
That's a fantastic idea. I'll invent, I'll, I'll invest in it. That's love. That's not knowledge. Don't take your money. Be careful who you take money from, whether it's relatives, friends, or otherwise. Because when you take that dollar, you're obligated, whether it's in writing or not. And they can destroy your future unless that money is coming from people who know what they do with their money and their ability to earn money on top of it. Okay? So just a, just a few words of wisdom from somebody who's been around a long time. Okay. Six years ago, or seven years ago, Bill and I created a program called Successful Inventing. It's transitioned over the years, and with the, with the help of Julie Mason from the Patent Office, this program has been refined to where it is today and where it is in the, in the future, near future. Pick up one of these on the desk out in front, and the program, and I won't go into detail, but the program covers this is the next six months, all the way through August. It's all virtual, so you can tune in between 11 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. Pacific Coast time. And for you people back east, there's a three-hour difference. <laughs> um, it starts with research, which is very important. Which applies to your questions. You better know where you are at all times with your invention. You can push buttons today, whereas not too many years ago, you had to go to big libraries, university libraries, to do research, to find out the answers to the questions you wanted. Don't rely on the answers entirely. They're not all right, and they're not all coming from resources that will help you. But doing the research is where you start. Is there another product like this on the market? Just because it's not on Amazon or Walmart doesn't mean it didn't exist 25 years ago. And a patent issue, which you cannot repatent, then it goes into protection. Hello, we're at the patent office. What better protection? Licensing. I have talked to thousands of inventors who want to set up manufacturing in their garage. They want to take the family savings and start producing a product. That's great. Assuming we've done all the research and protection. But have you thought about licensing? If you've applied for a patent, and you should have some backup, at least to know what it is you're going to be licensing, you could license it to a company who may be your potential greatest competitor, who will pay you a decent royalty after you found an agreement that should be looked at by an attorney. Don't go by handshakes. So licensing can provide you, as I said, with income for a long time, the life of the patent sometimes, that will save you the cost of creating a company to produce the product. Then it goes into product development. What you're doing there, we call Bill Seidel. Then it goes into, in July, your elevated pitch and plan. What are you going to do with it now that you've got a supposedly new product, hopefully? And then early stage funding. There is no shortage of money, there is a shortage of funding 
for good, potentially new products that have had all of the research and everything done to prepare for funding. People with money want to make more money. And if it's at your cost, that's fine too. They don't care. As long as you make something out of it also. Be very careful in dealing with people who want to invest. Once again, I'm telling you. Yeah. Again, there's no shortage of funding. But don't look at the fact that there's venture capital out there. All the venture capitalists have money. They're not interested in your invention. If you produce the product and maybe you're doing two or three or four or five million a year in sales, okay, they'll listen to you. Otherwise, venture capital is not the answer. It's private capital. There's a hundred billion dollars worth of private capital available in the United States. Family, family institutions, private individuals. Start thinking about who you would want to invest in your idea if you're going to produce it. What the benefits and advantages are going to be. What can they give you more than money? What can they give you advice? What can they help you guide your future and the success of the company? Look at the values beyond the money. And for heaven's sakes, don't get greedy. If they want 50% of something, think about it. And if they want 51%, think more about it. <laughs> but remember, Steve Jobs only owned 90 percent of Apple. He didn't own controlling interest in Apple. He was subjected to the decisions of the board of directors, which kicked him out once. So you do not have to own 100% of something to be successful. 